Shamima Begum was just 15 years old when she fled her home in the UK for life as an ISIS bride in what was then war-torn Syria. After an underage marriage and the loss of all three of her children, Shamima attempted to flee and come back home to the UK. But her appeals to return here have been steadfastly refused. Well, in a sensational documentary which aired last night, the now 21-year-old asks for forgiveness. She blames her decisions on being a dumb kid. So what do you think? Does she deserve a second chance? Does she deserve to come home, start again? We're joined now by filmmaker Andrew Drury, who spent quite a lot of time with Shamima just last week, and he says that, in his opinion, having met her and spent time with her, he thinks she should be able to come back to the UK. And Dr Rakib Essan, who's a research fellow on radicalisation and terrorism, he says he's not convinced by what he reckons is a PR campaign. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's start with you, Andrew, because, as I say, you spent days and days with her last week. In fact, I saw pictures in the paper yesterday. You, when you parted from her, you gave her a great big hug. She asked you for a hug and you, and you gave her a hug. Did you find your mind was being changed uh, as, you, as you met her and got to know her? I mean, as you, as you approached her for the first time, did you think that she should be stateless and be refused entry back in the UK? And did that opinion change? And if so, why? My first opinion of um, Shamima, before I went, this is, wasn't part of the documentary. We were there to um, document what was going on in Raqqa. So I'd seen what the regime and ISIS had carried out. So my opinion of her when I went there was... Well, Quite, quite angry at what she, she stood for and what I thought about her. I wanted her to rot in prison um, in, in Raqqa. So, but we had the, um, in our road, we had the opportunity to go and visit her. Um, and at the beginning, I saw a frightened child that regretted everything she had done. Um, she, she could go back, she could change it, but it didn't fool me. At the end, I did change my mind, but not based on sympathy, sympathy for, for her, based on the security of the camp. That camp is in a volatile area. So everybody's saying, let her rot there, be careful what you wish for, because that camp's under three or four different regimes. It's in an area that could be taken. ISIS itself come and um, liberate their camp. The Syrians themselves could disperse her um, in that area. I think it's more important we bring her back here so we have control of her. Sure if we lose control of her, she could be anywhere in Syria. OK, how sure are you, as a, as a human being, using all your senses that you've acquired as you've moved into maturity, how sure are you that she, her regret is genuine and it's not just an act? Well, you can't be, can you? Because, she, firstly, she's not an actress. And secondly, I had something to compare her to because I had a second English um, jihadi bride um, there. So I had a, a comparison. And that second one that I met, she, I, I, although I think want her to go to jail here, but she can rot anywhere. She was not a nice human being. So seeing Shamima, I don't think Shamima's been trained by anybody. I just think that she's a traumatised girl that has done wrong. And I do believe, and this is not a free Shamima campaign, she should come back here and fa um, face our judicial system mm. and be locked up for a long time. Well, Dr Raki Bessan, um, a number of people do subscribe to the idea. She was a teenager. Mm. Uh, she may have said offensive things. Uh, she may have done something absolutely atrocious simply by going, joining what people consider a death cult uh, and, and being a jihadi bride. But she was 15 at the time and therefore she deserves a second chance. She was not a mature adult. And the things that she was seeing online, the kind of propaganda, manipulated her. She was effectively groomed. Well, I, I make the point that when it comes to the more age-related defences, I don't really buy into them. She was 15 years of age when she essentially turned her back on her family, travelled thousands of miles to join a genocidal terrorist organisation. The age of criminal responsibility in England and Wales is 10. So she was five years above that. And I do feel that, I mean, I saw that Andrew, uh, based on the Daily Mail feature of the interview he had with her, referred to as a childish mistake. And I, I do think that's a serious act no, of trivialisation when no, we're discussing what happened here. In terms no, of her returning uh, to face trial, I think the public authorities, their reservations lie with the fact that only one in 10 ISIS returnees have been prosecuted. And that's largely because it's very difficult to investigate potential offen offences committed in foreign conflict-ridden territory mm -hmm. and collecting evidence in those kind of territories to facilitate prosecution. 
What do you make, though, of what Andrew says, which is if we don't bring her back, mm. then she could get lost in the territory and be careful mm. what you wish for. The consequences of not holding her to a sort of, you know, standard of justice which is respected over here could be worse. Well, and I think that what we have to think about in that particular situation is what are the risks that are attached to her returning to the UK. There are those who have argued that if she was to return, it would make the UK look like a soft touch when it comes to managing people who return from Islamic State back to the UK. So there's many uh, dynamics at play here which need to be considered. So what do you think is going to happen to her? Well, I, I can't look into the future, Susanna, but I'm just referring to what are the key concerns surrounding this particular case. All right, let's, let's come back to Andrew. The thing is, Andrew, when she first surfaced in, in the camp, when we first learned of her existence here, in, in the, she'd actually grown up. She wasn't 15 anymore. And in those early interviews and statements, she was quite shocking in what she said. She said that she'd seen beheadings and they hadn't phased her at all. I think she said she'd seen people being burned alive in cages and it hadn't phased her at all. And there's been quite a lot of informed speculation that she didn't just observe crimes, she actually coordinated executions. She, was, she actually had a hand in them, uh, and more than a hand, an organisational role. Now, we can't prove that, but that has been reported. Given that that was her first reaction when the British media went to see her, only a couple of years ago, don't you think that sort of puts a question mark over this new, westernised, sanitised, regretful, as some people would say it, act? Yeah, I mean, if it is an act and she has committed those crimes, which I've not heard of, then she should be back here. We should put, have evidence against that. Firstly, we're making statements we don't know. And if they are statements and she has committed those acts and she was part of the regime more than she made out to me or she spoke to me about her job was really as a baby maker and a cleaner, whether that be true or not. And of course she would say that. And she mentioned the heads in the bin statement that she had said. And she said when she was first interviewed, she was pre heavily pregnant. She was sitting in 42 degree heat in a chair um, opposite the um, interviewee, and she was traumatised by the war. So she, that's how she justifies it. But once again, I'm saying to you, I'm not here to make an appeal for Shamima. Um, and, for, and then also a, uh, a statement the doctor made. I never said she made a childish mistake. The statement in the paper says she says she made a yeah. childish mistake. And it's important we make these um, statements correct yeah. because that's not something I made. And I think that her mistake has to be criticised and she has to serve here. I don't think the doctor also understands the stability of the areas she's in. Not only that, then there's not just, we're talking about the women, we're talking about the children. He mentioned a 10 year old. I interviewed a 10 year old, a boy that was 14, who was forced to give a gun at 10. So I think we've got to be careful how we do sitting in a safe place. Andrew, uh, Andrew, was... Sh Andrew, Shamima, just to finish with her, Shamima, do you like her? Um, see, this is a difficult thing to say because the side of me that's patriotic about my country um, would say, no, no, I'm much done. But yeah, I did. I mean, I, I just felt sorry for her. Um, that's where the hug came. The hug, and that hug was a real difficult thing because she was crying, she was upset. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe people say I've been played, but I, I'm a human being, I'm a father. Um, I've got a girl, Holly, that sort of age. And it's not, it, it was that side I hadn't justified. She was in tears and she, I said, can I shake your hand? Because I didn't want to offend her. And she said, can I have a hug? And at that point, it wasn't, oh, my God, what am I doing? What am I doing? It was just a, a, a man uh, trying to just simplify it. Well, not even... It's so difficult. Comfort, it's such a... Comfort, I think, is the word you're looking for. Comfort her, yeah, yeah. just to comfort her, just to not make everything OK. I just didn't want to see her cry. I'm a man, you know, and, and that's how it was. Okay. I mean, Dr Essan, isn't there a danger that Shmima is uh, sort of a, a symbol of ISIS mm. to people here, and therefore she is the one being targeted for a vengeance against the death cult, which is disproportionate to the sort of justice that she should face? Well, I, I think that with the Supreme Court's ruling, it, it ultimately said that the Court of Appeals ruling didn't show sufficient respect for the Home Secretary's assessment uh, in terms of the significant national security risks attached to her return. I think the reality of the matter is, whether it's myself or Andrew, our core responsibility uh, in terms of occupation 
is not prioritizing public safety and national security, but that's the Home Secretary's core responsibility. Mm. I think that further down the line, I, I think it's especially when it comes to the revocation of our citizenship, we need to develop a long-term strategy in mm. terms of how we handle ISIS returnees. I'm okay. in favor of a fundamental modernization of our treason laws, right. which can have a retroactive element to them in order to ensure that strong penalties can be given for those who are found guilty of okay. joining terrorist organisations okay. okay. which have been prescribed okay. in the UK. And Andrew, just to come back to you for the last time, will you see her again? Will you stay in touch? She's asked me to go out, because she's asked me to go out and, and see her. She wants me to get all the documentaries that's been made about her, and she wants, in front of camera, um, to pick the lies by proof. And... And the last thing I want to say about her, I'm surprised that the government haven't gone out there because she said she has loads of information that she'd be quite willing to give over to stop this happening again. And one last thing I must say, and it's really important to me, making documentaries is really dangerous in that area. And I want to thank Gary Curtis and um, Rick Sweeney at Selcor uh, International for making sure I'm safe because us journalists and us working out in that area are at risk. And thank you. All right, well said. Thank you. We asked uh, Twitter, <clears throat> does Shamima deserve a second chance? Only 12% uh, back that. 88% no, she doesn't. Thank you very much indeed to our, our yes. guests.